Good evening. It is so good to be back in Dayton, Ohio. This is the Dayton homecoming. It's been eight years since um, we held a seminar here in Dayton in 2001 at the National Guard Armory. And I'm just delighted to be back here with you. And it's a joy to see your smiling faces. And I look forward to having a moment with each one of you. And thank you for coming tonight. I don't know why, but it seems as though I must be doing something wrong. Most of my seminars are beginning to look more like AARP conventions <laughs> than a dynamic, relevant, end-time study of God's Word. Well, we, we may be few and we may be old, but we're happy. I just am so happy to see each one of you here tonight. And I'd like to invite you to stand for the invocation as we begin. Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much for the privilege of being here this evening and the opportunity to study your precious word. And I just ask that you will bless this meeting with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and that we will each sense and realize the importance of your word as we see the world crumbling all around us. Thank you, Lord, for your mercies to us day by day and for the privilege of being back home with these wonderful people. In your name we pray. Amen. Be seated, please. It's going to be a challenge to um, try to keep everything all working here tonight. So if I mess up a time or two, um, I'm looking forward to Marty over here pointing that out for me. If you haven't met Marty or Shelly or Susie, I hope that you will look these people up. I would point them out to you, but it's dark in here. Um, three of the most wonderful people that you could possibly ever want to know. In fact, today we celebrated Marty's 15th year with Wake Up America seminars. Uh, Susie, last year, we celebrated her 15th year, and then we celebrated Shelley's 18th year last August, so she's coming up on 19. <laughs> it's just wonderful, and, and we all agreed at lunch today that the only way this has been possible is that soon after forming Wake Up America seminars, the Lord moved me out of town. <laughs> and they have done very well in my absence. Well, it's a joy to work with such dedicated Christians as Marty and Shelley and Susie. And, uh, you know, my first seminar was conducted about five miles from here 23 years ago. I never dreamed that we would be here today. I didn't anticipate 2009 ever showing up on our calendars. But the Lord's timing is perfect. And so we keep working, we keep studying, we keep watching, and we keep praying. That's what he counseled us to do. Amen? As you can see, the theme for this study is titled Circumstances and Consequences. Circumstances and Consequences. And tonight, I'm going to talk about the two witnesses. Some people like proof texts. I want to introduce you to a poof text. Please turn your cell phones off, or this is what will happen to them. The angels will grab them and throw them into the fiery furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is a poof text. Okay. I'd like to begin our study here with a serious thought. And listen carefully as you consider this. Throughout eternity past, present, and future, the Godhead has, has had, and will have two witnesses watching over 
their universe. And the consequence thus far, God's two witnesses have detected and reported two instances of rebellion. The first instance was Lucifer and his angels, and the second instance was Adam and Eve. Ever since the second occurrence of sin took place, God's biggest problem has been the prevention of a third episode of sin in a universe of children having the power of choice. Once a person understands the dimensions of the problem that God is working on, the actions and ways of God over the past 6,000 years will make a lot of sense. God's love, his wisdom, and strange ways make perfect sense when viewed in reverse. <laughs> True or false? This is why God requires his children to put total faith in him going forward. Now you know why salvation is based on faith. Faith is the only way that a finite being can fully trust and happily live with an all-knowing, infinite God that he will never understand. The biblical definition of faith can be summed up in three words. Trust and obey. Ask Noah. 120 years building the ark, preparing for a rain that he had never seen. Ask Abraham, who was called to leave home and didn't have any idea where he was going. Ask Moses, who after 40 years in the wilderness had no intention of returning to Egypt. Ask the three Hebrews that were thrown into the fiery furnace. They will tell you that the biblical definition of faith is simply this, trust and obey. Faith in God means submission to God's demands, whether we like the consequences or not. For example, God says, forgive those who hurt you. God says, give me a seventh of your time. God says, give me a tenth of your increase. God says, speak no evil, see no evil, and do no evil. God says, speak the truth, do not gossip, do not secretly diminish the character of others with rumors and lies. God says, do not use his name casually. God says, do not steal, kill, or commit adultery. God says, honor your parents. God says, do not worship any other God but me. God says, make your wrongs right. God's demands drive the carnal heart crazy. <laughs> yes? This is why Paul wrote in Romans 7, 8 or 7, the sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. Faith is a willingness to do whatever God commands without regard for the consequences. I hope you will remember this. Faith means trust and obey without regard for the consequences. Faith means trusting that God will achieve the results that he wants in each circumstance. At times, circumstances can put us in a position where the consequences get very ugly. I might lose my job. I might be disowned by my family. I might be thrown in prison or a fiery furnace, or I could go to the guillotine. But the uglier things get, the brighter faith shines. Ask Joseph. Sold into slavery by his brothers. Condemned by Potiphar to prison, only to be put on the throne and save a nation and his family.
from famine. Do you see faith at work in Joseph's life? Now, faith in God is destroyed by four maybes. Maybe God won't care. Maybe God won't see. Maybe God doesn't understand. How do you like that one? And maybe God isn't real. These four maybes, when they enter the mind, faith leaves the heart. You see, doubt in God is like carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide is an odorless, tasteless, and invisible poison, gas. But it is deadly. And so God has two carbon monoxide detectors in his universe. These detectors are called the two witnesses in the book of Revelation. They are also called by other names in the Bible. And the introduction of the two witnesses in the last book of the Bible can be a bit misleading because the two witnesses are as old as the Godhead. Many people think the two witnesses are a coming attraction, but the Bible teaches the two witnesses existed before anything was made. They will never wear out, and they will never give a false alarm. They are infallible. They are eternal, and they are omnipresent. Omnipresent means everywhere. At first, the two witnesses can be a bit complicated to understand, so God has personified them in the book of Revelation so that the final generation might fully understand them and their work. Now, listen carefully. For the past 30 years, I thought the two witnesses were the Bible and the Holy Spirit. If you've heard, it, you've heard me talk about the two witnesses, you know that's exactly what I believe. But for reasons that will be presented tonight, I had to change my mind. I have concluded that the two witnesses are, number one, the two supreme laws of the universe represented by the two lampstands, and the Holy Spirit, represented by the two olive trees, and they represent the early rain and the latter rain. I discovered my error when I found there is an important difference between God's two laws and God's word. You see, the Godhead has two supreme laws that are changeless and eternal, and you already know them. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And the second commandment is like it, that you should love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said in Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven that everything hangs on these two laws. Laws of love. I call these two laws the constitution of the universe. How simple. <laughs> How simple. God knows that commanding his children to obey these two laws is a lot like commanding a baby to go to sleep. Easy to do, but getting the desired result is another story. Let's put this in human terms. Little Johnny comes running into the house with a bloody nose. Dad yells out. Now you go out there and you be nice to your little sister. Do you hear me? Don't make me come out there and use a love switch on both of you. <laughs> How do you command someone to love if they just don't have it in them to love? What does the Bible say about the law of God? Psalm 19.7 says the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. And the precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light, sparkle to the eyes. Now watch this verse, Psalm 119, verse 160. All your words are true. All your righteous laws are what? Eternal. What does that mean? Having no beginning or end. Psalm 119, 
verse 165, just five verses later. Great peace have they who love your law, and nothing can make them stumble. Well, I've thought about these words for a long time. I've wondered, how do God's uh, laws make people um, joyful? How does it give peace? And how does it reduce offense? And how does God's law really work in, in, in our lives? Well, I've discovered that once we experience and discover what love is and what love, how it works and what it supposed to do, great peace takes over. I'm going to try to explain that tonight. So we want to continue. God's word tells us that love is the foundation of his government. And God is the embodiment of what love is and does. Notice Psalm 189 verse 14. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Love and faithfulness go before you. Okay, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Words cannot express how fortunate we are to have a sovereign God who upholds the principles of love regardless of circumstances and consequences. The Godhead is dedicated to upholding the rule of love throughout all eternity, and they are prepared to do whatever it takes to ensure that the universe will be governed by these two laws throughout eternity. God exalts the two laws of love above his own throne and authority. God's law is greater than God. Think about this for just a moment. In other words, God is subject to his own two laws just as we are subject to them. The great lawmaker is not above, whoops, the great lawmaker is not above his own laws. What was kept in the most holy place in God's temple? Now, notice the word most is highlighted. What was kept in the most holy place of God's temple? The law. Remember the law? The Ark of the Covenant, and inside the Ark of the little box there was the Ten Commandments. Well, and, and, and no one could enter the most holy place, no one, except the high priest, and then only one day out of the year. Right? Okay. What was kept in the holy place? And this means it's a little less holy. Most holy, a little less holy. There were three items in that room. There was a candlestick. There was the altar of incense. And there was the table of showbread or the table of the presence. The point here is that the law of God, which was kept in the most holy place, was given a higher and holier position in God's temple than God's own throne, which was located in the holy place. The table of showbread planted on the north side of the temple represented the throne of God. It's called more properly the table of of the presence. Why? Why was it designed, deliberately designed this way? Well, God's righteousness is defined, listen carefully, God's righteousness is defined by his own faithful adherence to his two laws of love. His system of justice is based on the administration of the two laws of love, not the exercise of arbitrary authority. God is not righteous because he says he's righteous. God is righteous because he can demonstrate that in all circumstances, he is law abiding. Amen? If God could have changed the law to forgive Adam and Eve and to redeem mankind, don't you think he would have done so? 
Yes or no? But he couldn't change his own law because he is always law abiding. Think about it. God is always law abiding. And this is what he and he's and he does so perfectly. And this is why we call him a righteous God. Not because he says so, but because it can be demonstrated that in every instance, throughout eternity, past, present, and future, God is in full compliance with the law of love. What a blessing it is for you and me to have as a supreme ruler of the universe a God who exalts love above himself as the principles that we will live by. Think if it were the other way around. What if we had a God, a God that was just a dictator, that was just arbitrary, that just did things because he wanted to do things and was careless and, and, and negligent? Well, eternity would soon turn into chaos, and eternal chaos would be awful. God's children can closely study and observe and fully test his actions against the two laws of love and every investigation will prove that his actions are in perfect compliance with the constitution of the universe. The really good news is that we have a God who is the perfect embodiment of love sitting on the highest throne in the universe. This awesome and all-powerful God ensures that righteousness and justice will be administered throughout eternity according to the two laws of love. This God of love is doing everything. Listen. This God of love is doing everything that an almighty God of love can do given the current circumstance that earth is in. I hear people say, Larry, why does God do this? Why has he let this happen? Why is he doing this? Well, that's a good question. The answer is not simple. And tonight, I'm trying to pull you into part of this answer. God's two laws limit the powers of God in a certain way. The two laws of love limit God's actions in certain ways. For example, love prohibits him from violating a person's will. Love grants the power of choice. Secondly, even though he is almighty God and he has powers that cannot be understood, God will not force anyone to love him or to worship him. The laws of love will not allow it. Because he has infinite wisdom, he does strange things at the present time. That will make perfect sense 6,000 years later. <laughs> this is why the Bible says, and we know, Paul says, Romans 8, 28, that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Trust and obey, for there's no other way. I love that gospel song. You never hear it, though, do you? Okay. We have to wait upon God because he is dealing with the problem of sin. Remember at the beginning of our study tonight? He is dealing with the problem of sin in such a way that sin will not rise a third time. Never again. Even in a universe of children having the power of of choice. That's the problem that he's solving with 6,000 years of sin. You see, divine love is the perfect balance between justice and mercy. He knows when to extract justice and he knows when to extend mercy. M mercy has its limits. Kindness has its limits. God's patience has its limits. The Bible clearly teaches that. When we look at the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, we see divine love at work.
don't we? Think about it for a minute. God gave the people of Sodom and Gomorrah opportunity to repent. How do I know? The Bible doesn't come right out and say that. How do I know that? Because I know God. He's constant. He's consistent. He destroys no one without first giving an opportunity to repent and reform. 120 years, he gave the antediluvians, Noah's day, a chance. He gave Israel many, many chances. So when we look at the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, we see divine love at work. And what is, the, what is love? What is divine love? The perfect balance between justice and mercy. You see, God loves the oncoming generation as much as he loves the present generation. And when the present generation has so messed up the world in which the oncoming generation must live, God destroys the current generation in order that the new generation can have a chance at life. That's why he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. They had so contaminated and so defiled life that the oncoming generation didn't stand a chance. So God just cauterized the cancer of sin right there and started over. That's what he did in Noah's day. When we look at Noah's flood, we see divine love at work. You see, when you say love, most people think, oh, happiness. Love is all about being patient and forgiving and merciful. But let me tell you something. The coin of love has two sides. Mercy and justice. Why do we euthanize animals that severely injure themselves like horses? Why do we do that? Because we know that putting a horse down, even if he's a multi-million dollar horse like a barrow, remember? Uh, we do so because it's the right thing to do. When we look at the Babylonian captivity, we see divine love at work. It was the right thing to do under the circumstance. Love at work. When we study the Great Tribulation, we see divine love at work. Most people don't want to talk about, don't want to hear anything about the Great Tribulation. But when we study the Great Tribulation, and when, when, once we understand it properly, we will find and discover that it is God's way of saving the maximum number of people. It's so cool. All of these things are fully consistent. That is Noah's flood, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, the great tribulation. All of these things are fully consistent with the death of Jesus on the cross. Another example of divine love at work. Divine wisdom knows when to extract justice and when to extend mercy. God exercises divine love every day with perfection, and this is why the Bible says, study him. God is love in action. Okay, now that we've examined God's two laws, the constitution of the universe, I want you to consider what the word of God really is. Unlike God's two laws, God's word. Now here I'm talking about what's recorded in the Bible call we call God's word. Unlike God's two laws, God's word is an ongoing revelation of truth, an endless stream of divine declarations that exalt and reveal the substance of the laws of love. I know you didn't hear all that. I got to say it again. Unlike God's two laws, God's word is a different thing altogether. 
God's word is an ongoing revelation of truth, an endless stream of divine declarations that exalt and reveal the substance of the laws of love. In other words, what I'm trying to tell you in plain English is that God's word is constantly pushing us into the laws of love. I'm going to give you an example that will perhaps make sense. Okay, let's look at the word of God. Genesis 2.16, And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. Okay. At times, God's word has the force of law. I'm not talking about the two laws. I'm talking about God's word. God's word has the force of law, and this is why I thought for many years the two lampstands represented the Old and New Testaments. I just did a simple equation. God's word equals God's law. But I was eventually forced into a theological corner because there is an important distinction between the word of God and the two laws of love. God's word actually drives his children into circumstances where the two laws of love produce difficult consequences. Think about it. His word is, is like a parent pushing a child to practice the piano. What's the, what's, the, what's the goal? The goal is for the child to play. But the parent lays down the law. <laughs> you practice or you can't go outside and play. God's word is, is like laying down the law, telling us, go forward, because you're going to crash into the two laws of love. And there we're going to refine and educate and, and, and make you a noble creature. Notice how it works. God creates children and then he spends the rest of eternity educating them. I thought some here might be able to relate to that. <laughs> I think of Marty when I, I thought of Marty when I wrote this. <laughs> to educate and equip his children for service, God speaks. He gives different commands at different times about different things. What for? A, to test and expand the faith of his creatures. B, to teach us new things that are unknown. And C, to reveal areas in our lives where we need improvement. For example, the word of God, now the word of God is not the two laws. The word of God set up a test for Adam and Eve to see if they would live in compliance with the two laws. And they failed. In a sinless condition, they failed. I rarely say anything profound. I'll say it again. And then a sinless condition, they failed. Yes or no? Eve loved everything the snake said. Her love for Jesus whom her creator, whom she well knew and with whom she had spent much time, should have stopped her from eating the fruit. But a talking snake was a new adventure, another interesting and beautiful sight to behold. Eve was seduced. Look at this, Genesis 3, verse 6. The Bible says, when the woman saw, that's, talking about using her peepers here, when she saw that the fruit of the tree was, one, good for food, and two, pleasing to the eye, and three, desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. It was practical, pretty, and powerful. Gulp. Eve was in a sinless state when she did this.
Adam had a different problem. Adam loved Eve too much. <laughs> Adam ate the forbidden fruit fully knowing that what he was doing was wrong. When Adam ate the fruit, he, number one, violated the word of God, which commanded him not to eat. And number two, he violated the first law of love by putting the second law of love above the higher law. You understand what I just said? Here's the problem for all of the romantics in the crowd tonight. Adam loved Eve as much as he loved himself. Okay, that's 100%. She was the only human being he knew. Okay? She was beautiful and his constant soulmate. She was family. She was everything to Adam. She paid the bills, took care of the garden, and prepared food for him. In fact, she was grocery shopping at the Tree of Life when she heard a voice in the forbidden tree calling her name. Eve was dependable, lovely, and a perfect companion. I have not yet figured out what Adam did when they lived in the garden. <laughs> Maybe his job was that of naming the animals. Anyway, while he was waiting for her to get lunch, he fell asleep. And the point here is that Adam so loved Eve that he was motivated by true and undying love to eat the forbidden fruit so that he could share in Eve's fate. If she wasn't going to live, he didn't want to live either. True love or misplaced love. Thus, Adam violated the first and highest law. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, and soul. Adam made the horrible mistake of loving Eve more than he loved God. Yes, Adam loved Eve as he loved himself, but he put his love for family above his love for God, and this was wrong. What a romantic love story. The first Romeo and Juliet. Well, let's look at this Romeo and Juliet tragedy. What is so romantic about 6,000 years of sorrow, death, abuse, sexual immorality, greed, idolatry, illness, cancer, rape, slavery, adultery, torture, and dishonesty? What is so romantic about it? The world has undergone 6,000 years of pure agony and torture because Adam violated the highest and first law of the universe. He put love for Eve higher than his love for God and look around at the nasty consequences. Look in the hospitals, the nursing homes. Look at the inhumanity in Darfur. Look at the grinding poverty in India and Africa. Look into the jails and the penitentiaries, and you can see the stinking, miserable outcome of Adam's words to Eve. Eve, I would rather not live than to be separated from you. Oh, precious Adam, you are such a sweetheart, so wonderful. Here, eat both of these. I picked them for you. One romantic sin is all it took. Therefore, Paul says in Romans 5, just as sin entered the world through one man, one man, not through Eve, but through Adam, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men because all have sinned. Listen carefully to this. This is another rare, profound statement. Law number one is always higher than law number two. Love God first, love wife next. Or love husband next. You see, listen, legalism is a religious life where law number two is missing. Love for God is all that matters. That's what legalism is. 
humanism is a religious life where law number one is missing. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Sooner or later, the devil manages to push every religion into abandoning one of the two laws of the universe because a one-law religion is highly destructive. Adam was the first humanist. Humanism is based on the idea that human beings can determine for themselves what is best for life and happiness. Right in our current time, one of the most uh, amazing arguments that's going on is the question of marriage. Is it between a man and a woman, or can it be two people of the same sex? This is really simply a humanistic argument. It produces conflicts for which there, are, there is an answer, but the answer cannot be determined when law one is missing. Humanism dethrones the wisdom and authority of God, and in its effort to avoid pain and unhappiness, it exalts human wisdom, which ultimately produces the very thing it seeks to avoid. Pain, unhappiness, degeneracy, decadence, and death. That's, what, that's all humanism brings. You would think that after 6,000 years of legalism and humanism, the human race would be ready to live by God's two rules. If Adam had not put Eve first, Jesus would have rescued Eve by dying in her place. And the offspring of Adam and Eve would not have suffered for 6,000 years. I want you to remember this. This sums it up. Adam blamed Eve. Eve blamed the snake. And the snake didn't have a leg to stand on. Do you see how the word of God tested Adam and Eve to determine whether they would live by the two laws of love? Do you see how it works now? Do you understand the difference between God's word and God's two laws in the story of Adam's failure? Um, let me take you to this little picture on the screen here. I've tried to show that the word, I've got a book here representing the Bible. And the word of God is constantly pushing us into circumstances and consequences to determine whether we will be submissive or defiant to the two laws. Loving God first and loving our neighbor as ourselves. And so God's word is constantly pushing, like a parent pushes a child, practice that piano. And so God's word is pushing us into circumstances that will determine whether we will live by the two laws or whether we will reject them. God's word isn't the two laws. The Holy Spirit, represented by the two olive trees, is constantly pushing us to try to get us to submit to God's two laws. But the Holy Spirit will not violate our will. As much as he wants us to enter into a life of God's wisdom, not our own, but God's direction, not our own, the, he pushes and pushes and pushes, but he will not violate any human's will. So he pushes, he pushes, and eventually we end up either submitting or defying the two laws. Those who defy the two laws reach a state called the unpardonable sin. Now, We'll talk more about this in just a minute, but I want you to get the idea 
that took me 30 years to clean up and to figure out that the Word of God is constantly pushing us into circumstances and consequences to test, like Adam and Eve, whether we will live by his two laws or not. That, does that make sense to you? God's two laws of love are eternal and changeless. Principles that God himself lives by. Any deviation from these two laws produces sin, and this is why we have all sinned. The two laws of the universe are not the word of God. God's word is about continuing education. God's word constantly pushes us into repeated collisions with the two laws of love because God never stops educating and refining his children. If we are willing to trust and obey the word of God, that is, live by faith, it is only a matter of time until we will collide head first <laughs> with the two laws of the universe. Well, this concludes the first half of our study tonight. I've just taken the time to set a stage for the second half, which I think is the best half. And if you will um, take now a 10-minute intermission, we will resume in just 10 minutes and continue with the second half.